El Salvador cryptocurrency. We have other countries that are looking into cryptocurrency. We've got something called NFTs or non-fungible tokens that are making waves with art, digital art being sold for $60 million as an NFT. I mean, honestly, as a futurist, all of this has to have some kind of an importance. I really feel something is starting to brew that is about to become very interesting. And so there's many people, there's many people who ha are saying, no, they're not vested into, into cryptocurrencies. And I'm talking about the chat. Tell one more question for me, is crypto giving you anxiety? Is this emerging era of crypto giving you anxiety? Say yes, if it is. What are we going to do with our clients? What are we going to do with our finances? How are we going to make business work? What about smart contracts? All of those questions. So yeah, oh, I got tons of people saying yes and no. So thank you for that. So what we're seeing folks as the evolution of crypto is a very initial stage. And this is my opinion. You can, you can have many other people talk about different things. I have just finished uh, directing a documentary called The Bitcoin Dilemma. And The Bitcoin Dilemma is all about what the hell is going on. And apologies for my, my, my clear language here. But literally, what is going on with cryptocurrency, with Bitcoin, with all of this? And uh, so we put together a lot of different amazing people who are telling us exactly where the industry is going. These are advocates. These are creators of cryptocurrency. And there's one theme that resonates with what everybody has said. And that theme is we are in the initial days, very initial days of cryptocurrency. So this webinar is right on time. It cannot be at a, at a, at a better time. And Jeremy, please stop me and give me a heads up if you want me to slow down and end my part. Uh, my guidance, quite literally, is based on what we're seeing right now, this is the time to immerse yourself into cryptocurrency, to understand what does Bitcoin do and why does it do that? I'm not going to go into how it's created and what mining is and how that all that happens. Please watch my documentary uh, for that. But we're at the very initial stage where different cryptocurrencies are even just stabilizing, right? We're not where it's something very stable that's accepted by the US government, by the Canadian government, by the Australian government or, or such like. We're still at a phase where governments are fighting the rise of crypto. For example, in China, uh, the government has said no to mining companies and said, please stop doing what you're doing. You've got Texas on the other hand, that's welcoming miners and quite and maybe becoming the mining capital of the world in the next few years. And so there's all these different parallels that we have to consider. In my opinion, I think crypto is an interesting space that the legal professions should jump on. All of you who are on this call, and we've got about more than 500 people on the call right now, you need to jump on crypto and start discussing, talking, which we are doing right now with this webinar to figure out what should the policies be? How does the law come into place? What taxation, what rules, what regulations should be in place? And start working with your groups, associations, and other organizations to influence where crypto should go. Nobody knows where it will go in the next five years because nobody, no one single person is controlling it. But all the things that crypto offers, the security, the safety, the, um, the, the inability to copy it, replicate it, I think this is really, really big. And I'm talking about what I've been observing over the last 20 years. Um, and so that's kind of um, my guidance. More than happy to answer any specific questions. I can pass it back to Jeremy. Uh, I think I've spoken for more than five minutes. So that serves as an intro. Uh, last but not least, I wanna plug my documentary here. Documentary comes out 15th of September. You can sign up for a pre-release special at bitcoindilemma.com. Uh, it's a simple mailing list and I'll let you know when it's out and I'll send you a copy myself. So thank you so much. It's bitcoindilemma.com. Thank you so much, Ian. And I'm sure we're all excited to, to watch that documentary when it comes out. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pose a question for Todd. Um, in what kinds of concerns are we hearing from, from clients at, in our law firm and from other places about, about cryptocurrency? Well, I would say that the term the Wild West best describes the cryptocurrency industry today. Uh, platforms that are trading in cryptocurrencies and exchanging and allowing other kinds of swaps are under scrutiny from securities commissions all over the world. Individuals are scrambling to understand how to best deal with taxation. 
We're hearing of people that are attempting to move to other jurisdictions and possibly not move themselves there. In other words, move their businesses without understanding simple issues in, in corporate law that they need to be aware of. Uh, so there, there's a common law principle of common mind, uh, uh, mind uh, control, controlling mind and management. <laughs> controlling mind and management refers to controlling a company from here in Canada, as an example, where the company might be located elsewhere. Well, that's problematic from a tax point of view. And then also when you're marketing to different uh, jurisdictions, since there's anonymity and you're not sure who's buying and selling uh, your crypto, well, you might be getting into a lot of trouble. Thank you very much, Todd. And before we get we dive into those compliance and taxation questions in detail, um, just a little bit more from Ian. I'd like to ask you, Ian, what, what are we seeing in, in terms of adoption of cryptocurrencies um, in various countries in the world? Of course, uh, it's fragmented. Everywhere you see, there's just huge fragmentation. And I think it's very normal for that fragmentation to take place. Nobody wants to jump on it right away. Nobody wants to risk it. Um, if you look at some governments across the world, you look at uh, the government of the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, they have a blockchain implementation in place. They have a federal blockchain strategy in place where all government entities will be finally on blockchain and crypto will be a very small part of it. So not everybody's 100% jumping on crypto, although blockchain is becoming much more interesting. So we need to pay attention to blockchain much more because it powers crypto, it powers NFTs, it powers smart contracts, which is where the real magic is. Uh, we heard about El Salvador recently, but El Salvador is not going to be the greatest case of crypto adoption in the world. It's, it's just a very small country with a small economic system. Uh, but it would be interesting to see if, uh, you know, if Venezuela goes with it, and then how would they tie their economic imports exports to that kind of a currency, and would they replace fiat or what? Um, so there's a lot more coming, I think, in the next few years uh, to see what happens. I just want to add one thing to my previous comment. I better answer Jeremy's question. And I'm watching a lot of the questions from the audience about you know, issues with banks and governments, central banks and governments are very much alert and aware and are taking action in reference to how to best deal with cryptocurrency. Drug runners, uh, 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 criminals, underworld individuals, terrorists and so on have been using cryptocurrency as uh, a method of, of funding illicit operations, which is direct, uh, diametrically opposed to the interests of, of governments and banks. So all these questions I'm seeing about banks and governments, unfortunately we have these types of characters that are involved and therefore makes the terrain much more difficult to navigate. Thanks so much, Todd and Ian. Um, I'd like to call on David Lesprance um, and talk about some of the issues that we're seeing with cryptocurrency exchanges, uh, KYC, know your client, anti-money laundering issues. Um, David, can you talk to us about that? Sure. Um, one of the things you've got to identify is what part of the ecosystem or parts of the ecosystem, you know, the, the client you're speaking with, are they a holder of crypto? Is that disclosed or undisclosed? Are they a miner? They have different issues. Are they running an exchange? So the promise of Bitcoin or the original idea behind Bitcoin is that it would be unregulated by everybody. Um, unfortunately, the reality is and, and companies like Binance are running into this headlong, which are governments want to ensure that it is not used for all the things Todd was talking about, whether that's ransomware, whether that's um, terrorists or drug money or all the things that we used to see on the Silk Road. Um, they are really going at regulation. And that regulation is the same type of regulation that financial institutions have gone through over the last 25 years. If we think of the world kind of before qualified intermediary and FATCA and common reporting standard and UBS, they, they will be regulating and they are heavily regulated. And really, even as an investor into any of these picks and shovels exchanges, you really have to look at the, the risk of whether your investment is going to go poof like BitMEX um, because the regulators lower the boom because the 
founders and the and the the company is are not properly dealing with KYC and any know your client and any money laundering issues. Thanks so much, David. And uh, just a reminder to the rest of the panelists: feel free to jump in if you if something pops in your mind and you'd like to make a comment. This is an open discussion. Um, Michael, I have a question for you. We've we talked about know your client. We've talked about anti-money laundering. What about issues with securities? Um, we're seeing situations with securities commissions shutting down exchanges. Um, we're seeing, uh, well, what do we see, Michael? Thanks, Jeremy. Well, what's happened now is, uh, I just wanna take you back to March. Towards the end of March, the Ontario Securities Commission uh, sent out a notice that uh, they now consider, this is a, their formal position, uh, that Bitcoin is a security. So what does that mean? It has not been established in the court of law. It has not been established at an OSC hearing. It has uh, nothing other than their opinion. Uh, but having the strength uh, of the Ontario Securities Commission, uh, their opinion is good for them. So in the end of March, they sent a notice out to the world. Uh, if you're dealing uh, in Bitcoin, uh, anywhere that involves Ontario residents, uh, then you must register with us. Call us and bring yourself into compliance with the Ontario Securities Commission. That's what they did March 29th. Um, and they gave people three weeks to become compliant or start to work to become compliant. So what happened um, by the end of May, 70 uh, companies, uh, contact the Ontario Securities Commission and said, uh, okay, we wanna be compliant. The problem with being compliant, the main problem, or one of the main problems in any event, is that to be compliant, there has to be a know your client. There has to be a KYC. You have to know the names of people you're dealing with. You have to know their addresses, their contact information, all sorts of other things. And the way Bitcoin is being traded today is based on total anonymity. So, uh, the feeling seems to be amongst the people with the uh, trading uh, platforms that if they had to uh, require compliance by everyone who's going to uh, purchase Bitcoins, then their business would be gone. That they have, it's very difficult to do that. On the other hand, uh, right now, there's no civil or criminal, criminal method to uh, act, be active against Bitcoin if you've lost your money. So it's not uh, too hard to lose your money on Bitcoin if you don't know what you're doing. It fluctuates up and down. So the OSC now um, in May of this year charged a company called Pol Poloniex. Poloniex is a company that was trading uh, into Canada as well as other parts of the world. Uh, the company is uh, uh, Seychelles, the Republic of Seychelles company. Uh, and that's where it exists. The OSC has gone after it. It's the first major charge in this area for uh, a, a trading platform that's not registered or not compliant with the OSC. So uh, they're now uh, looking into what Poloniex, but whatever anyone else is doing um, in, in this field. Of the 70 people that did respond, the companies that did respond to the OSC, 25% of them, just under 25%, are not resident in Canada. They're just somewhere else out there in the world. And interesting what happened is Seychelles um, cooperated greatly with the Ontario Securities Commission in the Poloniex matter. And um, Can Can uh, OSC in Canada now is part of an international uh, institutions that work with each other to help investigate so there can be um, charges laid on by the Securities Commission. So in the world out there, the free market of, of what's been going on is changing dramatically and is changing day by day. But now in Canada, it's changed. And in fact, if um, a company trading in Canada has assets elsewhere in the world, because of this international cooperation, uh, one the, the Securities Commissions are able to reach into uh, that country. Thank you so much, Michael. 
Now we're going to get a little bit more into into Canadian Securities Commission like the OSC, um, but question for Mayor Mackey, why are we talking about securities commissions and aren't, aren't we talking about a currency, a cryptocurrency? We're talk, we have altcoins, we have tokens. Well, are, are these securities or not? What's the difference between a security and a non-security, Mayor? Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, what we see a lot is we're helping clients become compliant. And I'll talk about initial coin offerings and some of the clients we're helping with, they did not take part in a traditional coin offering. So what we have to do is go through an analysis to see whether their initial coin offering is a security or not. And in turn, whether it comes under the guise of the OSC or any Canadian regulators. Um, broadly speaking, Canadian regulators, when considering whether a token amounts to a security, they will broadly consider substance over form in the context of distributions and registration requirements. One other in thing. other words, go ahead. Oh, no, please go ahead, man. Go, 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 Todd, jump in. I was just going to say, just to that point, it's very interesting. It depends on who you speak to. Uh, Fintrack has referred to crypto as a currency, of course. And you know, then we have the OSC that says, well, it's a security unless you can prove it's not. I think it, it's uh, the burden of proof is upon the uh, platform. Oh, for sure. And what you have to do when you go through this analysis, you got to look at the totality of the offering and the arrangements to determine whether it's a security or not. Um, I think every offering is unique. And when we see that it's a security, it's A, it involves an investment contract, and B, it's under one of the enumerated um, branches in Section 1.1 of the OSC. When it's considered a um, investment contract, a business owner should um, apply a four-prong test. Is it an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to come significantly from the efforts of others? When we look at this and we look at some of the people we're helping us, a lot of times the initial coin offering, it is considered a security and it does come under the guise of Canadian regulators. Thank you very much, Mayor. What are we seeing with, with some of our clients? Maybe Todd, Mayor, Michael, you can, you can comment on that. Well, we're seeing uh, people that are you know, technologically savvy that have undertaken um, to get into the crypto business without being thorough. So we're seeing lots of comments from our audience and it's confusing. I'm seeing people saying, wait a minute, from a tax point of view, it's not a security. <laughs> Other people are saying different things. And I would say that most of the comments I'm seeing, I agree with. Having said that, we have to be mindful of compliance. And what uh, we're seeing is individuals that are not getting good tax advice. Everyone from crypto holders to platforms to miners uh, that are operating in other countries, or people operating uh, mining machines in the US that are unknowingly being subjected to branch tax in the USA, where there's Canadian companies that you know, may hold the, uh, the currency wallets. We're, running, we're seeing situations where machines, mining, mining equipment is running, earning cryptocurrency being subject to, in some cases, to double taxation. Thank you, Todd. Um, I'd like to call on David. David, can you talk to us a little bit about foreign jurisdictions, um, cryptocurrency, and Ian, feel free to jump in as well. But David, why don't you kick it off? So again, going back to my earlier comment, you have to understand, uh, if we were talking about from a tax or an individual who's holding crypto, uh, what jurisdiction they're in, for example, South African rules are different than Canadian rules or different than US or Australian rules. So you have to understand that first. Um, you also have to understand the types of activities. Some jurisdictions will consider long-term capital gains. Others will consider ordinary income. Some of it will consider trading income. So understanding what jurisdiction you're in right now and then where can you go to? And you have similar issues with regards to currency exchanges or, or, or I'm sorry, uh, miners. Uh, crypto miners, one of the things that I've been very busy with in the last few months was that, the, as I think Todd mentioned earlier, the Chinese literally pulled the plug on, on crypto miners, which meant that they were scrambling 
both personally because they don't want to become the next Jack Ma and their businesses were scrambling because if you're if you're not hashing, you're not making money. And so, you know, they were thinking, where do we go to? And some jurisdictions um, such as Uzbekistan were talked about uh, today, the uh, president of Belarus had come on here. But you've got to make sure that you you don't jump out of the sovereign risk of the Chinese closing you down and into the hands of an, of another sovereign risk. So you really have to understand that what type of power you're getting. Uh, you don't want to have an Elon Musk tweet that you have dirty power, and that's going to affect your your business or the regulation. So you really need to understand the types of clients they have, what their current situation is, and how arbitraging different jurisdictions are going to meet their particular goals. Great. So in terms of governments and regulations, is there a jurisdiction that we would you would recommend for people looking to mine crypto, David? Or you? So we well, may accept with smiling, David, when uh, when Jeremy just asked you that question. <laughs> <laughs> so so if we look at miners, for example, we may actually separate the tax residents of the of the individuals from their business. So we, for example, if you're a miner, your business, you want several things. Number one is you want energy at a reasonable price. You would prefer clean energy if that's possible. And you also want to be in a jurisdiction where there's the rule of law, where you're not going to have a knock on the door and a government official changes their mind and you're out of business or somebody knocks on the door and says, you know, nice mine you have here. Uh, leave the keys. There's a car for you and your family to go to the airport. So that's for the, for the operation. For the individual, how they, they hold that, for example, you know, Todd can, can jump in on, on that as an example for crypto mining. And one of the things I'd, I'd like to say is uh, that this is, oh, sorry, Jeff. Oh, no, go ahead, Todd, please. Oh, uh, one of the things I'd like to say is this is not an encouragement or inducement or any other suggestion that individuals say in Canada should consider setting up shop elsewhere. Uh, if you are in an area that um, and your uh, activity in the crypto space would draw scrutiny from Securities Commission, you can run, but you cannot hide. If you remain in Canada and you're attempting to run a platform out of Portugal or some other place, good luck to you because at the end of the day, you won't get away with it. You are tied to Canada. From a tax point of view, you're also tied to Canada. From a standpoint of um, tax efficiencies, well, it, whatever you have, have in mind probably isn't going to work, <laughs> if that is the case. And we're, we're meeting a lot of people in these situations that are just not getting the most basic fundamental advice, uh, mostly because it's a brand new area. And, and most accountants and lawyers are, don't really know a lot about this, the implications of crypto. And, and on uh, that, Todd, it wasn't that I was suggesting that you would you're running to hide like you used to try to find the secret jurisdiction for your bank account. It's which jurisdiction will allow you to be legally compliant and meet your particular goals, whether, and those are different goals for somebody who holds crypto, for an exchange, and for miners, different parts of the ecosystem. Oh, for sure. I, I think uh, maybe Todd, you can speak to this, but I think it's important where we talk about the controlling mind uh, when we talk about going outside of Canada. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly um, basic premise in common law that the principle that deals with controlling mind and management. And really what it means is, is that if, you're, if you are a resident of Canada, say for tax purposes, or, or you're here and you're controlling a company elsewhere, well, that company is deemed to be a Canadian company since you're controlling it from here. And that, that's what I was referring to. Now, leaving Canada is fine if that's your choice. And it may be the best choice for you, but that would require divesting of all of your Canadian assets in order to ensure that you're, you know, being prudent and you understand things like departure taxes and other things. Um, it's not that you can't leave Canada, you can, but you have to be aware of what's involved in that. And when you're trying to control things remotely, it doesn't work. I think Ian was attempting to comment on that. I'm sorry, Ian, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no problem. I, I com completely love this discussion. And I want to ask audiences here and folks, anything I say, and I, I think I can uh, just say this, anything I say is not legal advice. It's not tax advice. It's not accounting advice. I'm an independent 
uh, professional, so please take it like that. My question to the audience here is, if you could save on taxes as an organization, if you could not evade taxes, but save on taxes, whichever in a proper legal manner, would you want to do that as an organization? I want a yes or a no. Would you want to save taxes? Would you want to save paying taxes? And then part two of my statement will follow after I see responses. Okay, great. Everybody wants to save taxes. The entire world wants to save taxes, right? We're not evading taxes. We want to contribute to society, business, and all of that. And for that very reason, that's the motivation that mining companies have right now. I'm going back into the psychology of miners and what they're doing and what we should do about it. It's all about saving on taxes. We started with Iceland, where energy was cheap. Everything was running on geothermal energy. Uh, and so this, the miners started moving from one country to the other. They started going to China, establishing it there, cheap energy. They're going to Texas now, cheap energy. But these are just big, big pockets of um, countries or regions where tax savings are significant. Mm. Uh, spend on energy is very less. So we've got to understand where miners are headed. I really believe as, in my opinion and what I see, I think Canada generally is not very friendly with energy. We're not very, I'm Canadian myself. We're, we don't have good energy pricing. And I see that as a challenge for miners to set up a lot of shop in Canada. So they're going to chase the countries that are low, low, low cost countries, not necessarily tax evading countries, or, but that is a big factor in where miners will go next. I have hopes for CIS, some countries like Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, uh, or Russia or South America, uh, we've got to keep a mind open and see where are they headed and, and what's driving them. So everybody wants to save taxes. Taxes, cost of energy are two big drivers for this. And in fact, if I that uh, the energy situation uh, comes with uh, uh, environmental hazards, it's a huge, uh, to have a mine, it's a huge uh, user of energy. And in fact, I read something uh, last week that said um, in a recent study in 2021, uh, miners just in the USA will use more energy than 159 countries put together. And I'm sure those countries were smaller countries, but still it takes a huge amount and it takes the, the where you're located, uh, it uses a huge amount of energy and that's affecting local and regional governments and, and politicians are trying to figure out a way to, uh, to take care of this. And lastly, there's a huge environmental uh, footprint that's left from a mining uh, area. Uh, I'd just like to add, Michael, uh, and somebody's Chapman uh, Swain has also posted this comment just now about the traditional banking industry. We've covered this point in the Bitcoin Dilemma documentary as well. So here's a fact. The fact is that Bitcoin network, just the Bitcoin network has amazingly reduced the amount of energy consumption it used to have in the initial days and where it got this dark cloud that's hanging on top of it, that it's a very energy heavy industry. It has really significantly gone down. There are other cryptocurrencies and we're talking crypto right now that have a very low energy footprint that are running on renewable energy. And so that situation is really, really changing as well. Of course, there's an energy footprint for sure. There is a carbon footprint, but it's it has dramatically reduced uh, over the past decade. And I'm really going with the fact that the more renewables these industries use, the better it's going to be. So that's its work in progress for sure. Well, and just on that point, I, I, I've also been following uh, following that. There was a comment by uh, uh, somebody a moment ago that you know that the the energy use for Bitcoin is equivalent to the energy used by electric uh, dryers in the United States. I'd also heard by Christmas lights. Um, so the question is, you know, dryers do things. They get our clothes dry. Christmas lights amuse us. You know, does Bit Bitcoin, are we creating something which has a life and a utility beyond the moment of its creation? And so that's another factor to look at. And one of the things in, in choosing jurisdictions, because this is a discussion we're having um, a lot of, and it's, you know, and I'm, again, I'm completely agnostic with regards to jurisdictions, but one of the real 
things you have to think about is the stability of the jurisdiction and the rule of law. It's all very nice that you have low costs with regards to utilities, but if you lose all your capital because the government comes in or, or criminal elements come in and swoop in and clo close that out, that's devastating. So you may have to balance you know, the type of energy you get and your cost, the, the clean energy and the rule of law with just the, the pure low cost. It is a, a balancing act for sure. Thank, thank you so much. Just before we move on to taxation, we'll, we'll just sum up what we talked about with the securities issues. If, if you, we don't offer legal advice, by the way, on this platform, we are a law firm, and we recommend that you, you, you retain legal counsel. Um, on, if you are a company, you're a crypto exchange, or you're, you're launching a crypto coin, um, make sure that you're compliant. We can't stress that enough. Retain legal counsel. Make sure that you're compliant. Um, thank you, by the way, for your comments on the environmental aspect as well. That's much appreciated. Now I'd like to jump into the taxation part. Um, Todd, how, how, is crypto, how is crypto taxed, at least from the Canadian point of view? Yeah, so, so typically, you know, CRA treats it as a barter, this capital gain that's, um, uh, that's often uh, added to income when there's uh, either conversion to fiat or to, to, to another type of uh, commodity or, or cryptocurrency. Um, oftentimes, um, this is, I guess, overlooked. And, uh, you know, a lot of times if you're, um, if you're considering the best way to structure and to uh, 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 set up a business of any kind, well, I think that one of the things that most often is overlooked is the basic fundamental reasons why we should do planning. One of those things is asset protection. Another one is intergenerational transfer of wealth. In other words, ensuring that you know, the, your assets are properly uh, arranged so as to transfer your assets to the next generation over time. Also the year by year taxation. What, what do you enjoy when you're alive? And I think that's pretty important. So these general issues uh, are, are important. What if somebody sues you? And there's a hundred different issues to consider that I think are, are often being overlooked, but it, there's no reason that individuals who are involved in cryptocurrency, either as an investor or as a platform or you know, as a mining operation, there's no reason why they shouldn't be thinking very, very closely about these kinds of issues. Thank you very much, Todd. Todd, we have a slide prepared that goes into a, a fairly basic but important corporate structure for individuals um, who are investing in cryptocurrency. Um, maybe you can take a minute to explain what, why, it, first of all, why it's important to look at your corporate structure. Um, and secondly, what, what are the advantages of, of doing that? Well, I think one of the first you know, questions is if someone sues you, um, what's going to happen to your assets, whether it's, you know, no matter what kind of assets it is. And I realize there's anonymity and so on with wallets. And, but uh, I noticed one of the questions that someone asked, you know, uh, to what extent do we have to be concerned, you know, about anonymity? Well, the government will be um, requiring reporting. That is a fact. Although individuals uh, may be able to fly under the radar, as it were, that's temporary. And governments around the world uh, have a vested interest in ensuring they receive their uh, rightful tax on assets in any taxable jurisdiction. And for all of the other reasons that our expert panel has been discussing. So one of the things that we often see is, you know, individuals are accumulating quite excessive, large excessive amounts of wealth. And sometimes they'll hold it personally. And sometimes uh, it, we, they put it into a corporation. And other times they're using a corporation, but they're not really using it. In other words, they're, they're either trading or they're doing uh, other, other type of activity, um, perhaps not under pro proper uh, protection, asset protection. So corporation can provide some asset protection, provides what's called limited liability in Canada. So in, in general, what it really means is if there's a claim um, against the company, well, it'll be, the liability be limited to that corporation and other assets may not be able to be attached. Having said that, there's all sorts of uh, reasons that that can be challenged, such as the Fraudulent Conveyances Act, such as director's liability. There's many reasons that it's important 
to set up a, a corporate structure properly. So this is just a snapshot, Jeremy, that you, I guess you put together that describes a fairly common typical structure. So if you have a, a wallet or cryptocurrency, you may want to consider uh, setting up a corporation if you haven't already done that, and then doing what's called a rollover. A rollover essentially means that you can take the wallet and transfer it into the corporation and then take back shares of the corporation without any tax. Well, that's good. It gives you some protection, perhaps, but not necessarily. Uh, when we do these kinds of structures, it's often important to consider what happens at the top. If you're the shareholder of a company personally, and again, there's a, a claim under the Family Law Act or some other type of liability that could affect you, well, again, your whole empire could be gone very quickly if you got sued personally. So one of the things we, we often suggest to business owners and individuals that are involved in this space is why not set up a trust to hold the shares? Well, one very practical reason is because if you set up a trust, well, then you don't own the shares directly. A trust owns the shares. And of course, a lot of people will say, wow, this sounds pretty uh, confusing. What is a trust? When did trust start? <laughs> what are trusts about? How do you use a trust? And more importantly, what are the benefits? So one of the things I usually say to business owners or individuals that are involved in cryptocurrency uh, is the best way to understand a trust, it's a, it's a, in this case, it's a family trust. Um, and there's different kinds of trust. There's what's called testamentary trusts that are created by your will and only come into effect after we die. And then there's what's called an inter vivos trust, in other words, a trust for the living. And this particular trust is a fully discretionary trust. And essentially we have trustees, which would be the, you know, the entrepreneurs, and then the beneficiaries would be all of the family members, including the entrepreneurs in many cases. And these trusts are set up in a way so that we achieve very superior asset protection. And one of the bottom line uh, issues here is, again, uh, you could think of a thousand reasons you could get sued. You might hit a guy at a crosswalk who can't walk for the rest of his life. And it's okay if he earns 100,000 or 200,000 a year, but if he's a billionaire, there may be a claim for far in excess of your liability insurance. It might be a couple million, but you could have a $30 million claim and lose your whole portfolio. So one of the things we often do is we set up trusts, and sometimes we set up tr trusts in jurisdictions that have better legislation than we have, say, here in Canada. Sometimes we go to New Zealand or St. Lucia or Barbados, a number of different jurisdictions, all of which have, I'm going to say, uh, debtor-friendly legislation. In Canada, we have creditor-friendly legislation that basically goes back to the 1600s. It's provincial legislation. It's referred to as the Statute of Elizabeth. And essentially what it states, if you attempt to hinder, to delay, or defraud a creditor, well, a court can make a special award that results in break, piercing your corporate veil or breaking a trust even. So it's very important that you set things up properly. And in some instances, we're able to set up structures where we don't really send any money outside of Canada nor do we send any, uh, set up any corporations there. We simply use a foreign trust as a holding instrument to hold the controlling interest of a company that does investments in crypto or anything else. And that can give an, um, really a significant amount of asset protection. And when we do this, well, there's also uh, a natural consequence of achieving this superior asset protection. And the natural consequence is, is that there, you know, there's certain trade-offs that work to your benefit. If you have a, an, an act of business, you have a small business deduction, meaning that you pay a lower rate of tax on the first 500,000, you have capital gains exemptions, so you sell the, your business or die, well, you have exemptions to capital gains tax, but you don't have those things necessarily at all in this kind of an investment company that holds cryptocurrency. But what you do have is a trade-off in that if it's a foreign controlled company, well, first of all, there's no federal surtax, there's no refundable tax. And rather than paying tax at say 25% on, on uh, when you convert to, to fiat or other currencies, you're only paying tax at 13.25%. And if you're earning income here, well, rather than paying tax on passive income at 50.17% in the province of Ontario, your tax rate is reduced to only 26.5%. I was muted. Thank you so much, Todd. So we're able to create real asset protection for 
Again, we're focusing on Canadian residents here. Most of our audience is from Canada today, but not all of them. So we're able to create real asset protection with other benefits, including estate planning, reduction of tax today, and also reduction of tax in the future by using the correct corporate structure. Um, I'd like to ask a question to David, and I'd like Ian, Michael, everyone to comment on it, uh, on the topic of an uh, an anonymity, uh, being anonymous. So why are we talking about tax? Why are we talking about asset protection if crypto is an anonymous asset? Um, is that the right way to look at it? Um, maybe, David, you can start and comment on that. Sure. People who have undisclosed crypto, particularly with capital gains, are kind of at a crossroads. Their first path is that they can come in out of the dark, make voluntary disclosure, retain you know, a, a firm like Quantum, make a proper voluntary disclosure, and organize themselves, look at either domestic and or international strategies to organize themselves to be legally more tax efficient in the future. Or path B is resign themselves to playing a game of hide and seek with the tax authority opponent who has endless resources, endless time, and the help of all the other tax authorities. Now, I've been hearing for, you know, the solution of the week, mixers. Okay, well, you know, if you follow the news, the, the head of Helix, which was a major mixer, he all of a sudden uh, was charged, and guess what he's using to knock down his, his, his sentencing? All the information on all those mixes that he did. Uh, people inadvertently, you know, tell, when I was going through law school, I worked as a customs official. Our number one source of tips, there's whistleblower laws, was ex-partners, ex-girlfriends, ex-wives, jealous neighbors who you were bragging to, or you bought something like a Tesla or something else, and you've get, now got, uh, you know, lifestyle audits. So the people who are smart are not going to stick their head in the sand. They're going to really bring themselves, retain a proper firm, bring themselves into compliance, pay the tax, whatever they need to at this point, and then use strategies like the ones we've been talking about in moving forward in a tax efficient manner, a way that deals with their goals like asset protection. Oh, you're muted, Todd, or Jeremy. Second time. Thank you so much, David. Um, let's let's move on to one. Or Ian, did you have a mayor? mayor? I, I had a real quick comment on, uh, and we we heard a couple of times the the fact of anonymity. Uh, I just want to make it clear that not all cryptocurrencies are anonymous. Bitcoin is not one hundred percent anonymous, and there's a very small set of uh, cryptos, uh, Moneris and a few others that offer 100% crypto or 100% anonymity. Bitcoin can still be tracked. There's different ways of tracking it. It's not easy, but they're still tra traceable and trackable. So there's, there's a lot in there, folks. There's a lot to understand about different types of crypto, but anonymity is a function that can be enabled and not all cryptos are 100% anonymous. Thank you. Uh, important distinction to make. Thank you very much for that, Ian. Uh, Mayor, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just want to piggyback on what Todd said in regards to setting up this corporate structure. We recently had a very successful couple. Um, they're miners. We rolled their assets into a corporation, set up a structure for them with a family trust. And one thing I want to touch upon is a family trust in terms of asset protection. Family trusts go back to the medieval times. There's strong case law surrounding a family trust. Courts are reluctant to break a family trust, whether it's a lawsuit, creditors, or anything like that. It's left for the benefit of others. You'll see once in a while a court will break it up in a court of appeal case like Spencer versus Spencer, where it's a um, equalizing that family property where one of the trustees was exercising control. But those are rare circumstances. So family trust is utilized and it's very good um, in terms of asset protection. And also you can multiply your capital gains exemptions. 
um, when using that. So we've used that successfully in helping minors and so on and so forth. I just noticed there's a couple of questions and maybe I'll just uh, answer very quickly. Um, so one of the questions we had is a crypto wallet eligible property to be transferred under section 85 of the Income Tax Act. And the answer is yes, it is. Another question referred to, <laughs> asked about, you know, to what authority we depend upon. Well, the wording in the act is sufficiently broad that we have no problem in, in, in doing this. Uh, again, not legal, this is not legal advice. We don't want you just to go off and try to do this at home. Uh, you do need to consult. Every situation is different. And we have to look at the, at the, at the matter very carefully in order to, to verify that. And someone else asked if there's a, a taxable disposition if you're transferring the assets to a trust. Well, in the diagram that Jeremy displayed, he showed a corporation and the wallet was rolled into the corporation and the trust was at the top. The trust had the shares that controlled the corporation, but the individual received the shares back. So the structure that was being described does not trigger tax, even though it gives you the asset protection that is, uh, I'm going to say, very superior along with uh, the tax, the uh, automatic natural consequences of tax that become uh, available as a, as a result of using a non-Canadian trust to hold shares of a Canadian corporation. Thank you, Todd. Uh, maybe Todd, can you, can you comment on, on this slide? We have, we, we're, we've been talking to crypto miners and crypto holders um, and other individuals in the crypto space. What about, people who have other businesses or may, the business may be crypto, what can we do for general tax planning and asset protection for business owners? Yeah, so let's just say that uh, there's a few different tools in the tax planning toolbox that we sometimes use that are not very common, um, at least are not very well understood is a better way to put it. Now, for those of you who are in the US, well, uh, we're not, first of all, we're not a U.S. tax law firm, and we're, again, we're not giving advice uh, to you specifically on this, but what we will say is Canada has something that's amazing, and it has uh, an opportunity to be able to um, transfer assets without any tax whatsoever, which is extraordinary. Well, if you take the shares of a corporation and you decide to give them to your children or other family members, well, we know that triggers tax. There's a taxable disposition. There's a deemed disposition that happens at death. And when you transfer assets for a less than fair market value, you're triggering a taxable event at full fair market value. But one of the things that we do have in Canada that I believe is underappreciated is the estate freeze. Now, a lot of people have heard of an estate freeze and just like they've heard of trusts, and I think they're equally as unfamiliar with, as one with the other. Essentially, an estate freeze allows you to be able to freeze minimize, mitigate, cap, freeze the value of your interest in your company, in your corporation, so that later on, you're paying less tax, particularly at death. Now, in the context of an operating company, and I would assume, uh, since Jeremy's put, written here that it's a, an act of business, we'll just maybe talk about that for a moment, because we do know that a lot of our clients do have uh, businesses as well. They have, they have active businesses that they're operating. And oftentimes it's a matter of creating a conduit or uh, a method of transferring assets from one entity to another without triggering tax. So when we do an estate freeze, let's talk about that first. A state freeze is best understood as freezing the value of the shares that you hold. Like I said before, it's, a, it's accomplished by understanding that there are two basic kinds of shares of private companies. And one is a common share, which means that the shares will grow in value. If the company's worth $10 million, well, then the shares are worth $10 million. If it grows to $100 million, so will the shares. Well, there's another kind of share that you all know about, and those are called preferred shares. Preferred shares have a stated value, and the value never changes. So when you exchange common shares that grow for preferred shares that don't grow, well, we, we go inside of the... Uh, the corporation, the guts of the corporation, we look at your minute book and inside there you have articles of incorporation and share provisions. We wanna make sure you have the right kinds of shares. Once we do that, we pass resolutions and we exchange shares and we are able to achieve an estate freeze that allows you to freeze what you have for the purpose of then transferring all the future growth to a trust as an example. 
Jeremy, uh, I guess uh, Mary had mentioned about the fact that, you know, trusts have been around for a long time. They're rooted in antiquity. The first record of a trust goes back to the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman Empire, where an individual was on his deathbed. And uh, his, one of his seemingly good friends had offered to re receive his assets on his death since his wife and children were not citizens of Rome. They were not legally entitled to inherit that property. Well, he offered to take care of them. And we all know that he didn't. He was punished severely by the emperor of Rome. So we're, we're saying this is not new. This is something that's uh, fairly standard in our world, but it really allows you to be able to create this trust so that you're pushing all the future value. For your operating company, it means you could have multiple capital gains exemptions. We know the capital gains exemption this year is say a little less than 900,000. Well, that can sometimes be multiplied by spouses, children, grandchildren, children or grandchildren who are not even born yet, having the effect of being able to reduce tax remarkably. The other thing we're able to do was create conduits that would go between the Canadian operating company and the investment company. And it can serve a dual purpose. In other words, what we are able to do is create insulation. And the insulation would be the vertical part on Jeremy's slide that shows the Canadian investment company that holds the cryptocurrency and it shows the trust on top. But what it doesn't necessarily explain when you look at the slide is there are ways of paying dividends without any tax from one corporation to another if it's done properly. The hows and the whys and the why nots are way too complicated for us to cover on today's session. But if you're in this situation, there are a lot of solutions that are available to you. Thank, thank you so much, Todd. So bottom line is, if you're a Canadian business owner and you haven't done an estate freeze, you haven't looked at a foreign trust, you haven't purified your companies, you should look at those things. There's a lot of money to be saved in unnecessary tax. There's a lot of planning you can do for your future and the future of your family. And there's a lot of things you can do to protect your wealth and to protect your assets, um, even as a Canadian taxpayer. Now, Michael had brought up earlier that securities commissions around the world, especially in North America, are clamping down on cryptocurrency uh, companies. So question is, what's, what's the future for, for cryptocurrency um, in Canada? I'll, I'll open that question up to the panelists if someone would like to comment. You know, when you think about the effect of cryptocurrency, it's transforming our lives in many ways those of us that are involved with crypto. If we think back through the history of mankind, we know that there's been various different forms of barter. And eventually precious metals became a major part of, of, uh, of the economics of, 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 uh, of, of uh, commerce. Uh, after a period of time, it went to paper, interestingly. And of course the paper backed by gold and other precious metals. Uh, now we're looking at a, a situation you can walk in and swipe a card or display something on your phone and have it built somewhere. The world is changing, like it or not. So I'm going to kick it off by saying cryptocurrency is here, whether any of us like it or not. How we deal with it, how we navigate this journey is a daunting process and requires uh, some very keen insight into very neglected areas. But Jeremy, I think the answer, or an answer to your question is, learn to be compliant. Learn to work within what uh, the, the regulators say we're happy for you to be in this business. But like every other business, there are rules, and there's regulations, and uh, uh, we all have to stop at red lights, and we do. So if this is a red light, uh, we have to change. I agree with Todd completely that and Ian, of course, and uh, well, everybody on the panel, especially you, David. But um, David didn't smile when I said that, but uh, the point is, it is going to live. It's just going to have a, a different uh, character to it. And that once we all have to be compliant, we'll all be compliant. That's just the way it is. Or don't open a bank account. You have to be compliant to open a bank account. Why not, uh, why not for crypto? Ian, I'd like to hear your comment on that, if you don't mind me asking about where you see crypto changing uh, the world as we know it. Absolutely. I, I really feel we are still in the early days. I see a long, it's going to take a long time before crypto is adopted by the mainstream banks, unless they come up with their own cryptocurrency, which some, some institutions and governments are working on. I think for Canada, it's going to take a long time because 
we do things in a very structured manner in Canada. It takes a long time for things to happen in Canada. That's part number one. Another part is this is really disruptive for the existing monetary system, existing banking system. So unless they're fully integrated into this idea and they benefit and gain from it somehow, the CRA gains from it, like everybody has a gain from it, it's not going to happen. So I would really recommend jump deep into crypto by learning about them, what backs them up. What is, what's the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin and Litecoin and Dogecoin? Why are they different? What about smart contracts? What about blockchain? What about uh, non-fungible tokens? Once you understand the entire picture, I really believe you'll be at a better position of understanding crypto and its impact. But there's much more to the industry than just cryptocurrency. There's other things that are, that are going to come up that are here now that can change our, you know, our, our day-to-day -day workings. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Uh, David, do you have a closing closing thought there? I was just going to say, in following on, on Ian, I, I was really had to focus on what a blockchain was by having to deal with, with crypto. And the blockchain, smart contracts, fractionalization, uh, these are going to be really transformative in currency and all across all kinds of assets, just to be able to specifically identify and separate ledgers and be able to, to trust that, you know, I, I own that thing. Um, so it's, it's going to be, and I, I think Ian is absolutely right. Even if you don't think it's going to be part of your, your investment portfolio, you really do need to learn about this technology just as you needed to learn about the internet when it came in and the World Wide Web when it came in. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to all of our expert panel. Thank you to all of our, our attendees today. Um, what we'd like to encourage everyone to do is whether you're in, if you're an investor, what are you doing for asset protection, tax planning, estate planning? If you're running a crypto company, are you compliant with securities, commissions, and with other things? We'd encourage everyone to think about those things. Um, that wraps up our session for today. Um, here, if, you, if you have any questions, um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us uh, at quantumbusinesslawinfo at qbl.ca. Feel free to send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, thank you all so much for attending today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ian and David. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.